just have to be careful. I don't, get, I don't wanna get burned. Can you hear me all the way in the back? I'm pulling out my phone just because I'm really bad at keeping time. It's not that I'm gonna be texting from here, okay? Just wanna make sure that I don't speak for like two hours. Hola, buenos dias. Thank you very much uh, for being here. Uh, you can tell I was really nervous before starting the, the, this talk because I dropped my papers and my Kindle. So I just I wanted to be careful, you know, with the light. I didn't wanna, you know, I'm so clumsy. Okay, before deciding what I wanted to talk about, you know, I thought about talking about my life and I could have talked about, you know, I love dancing, I love reading, I love teaching and all those things. But then I wanted to um, talk a little bit about you guys too, because I think that for you, um, especially for those who are juniors and seniors and pretty much everybody, you have to make uh, very important life decisions right now. And whether you like it or not, you have your parents, you have your teachers, they can guide you, but in the end you are the ones that have to make these big decisions, right? What school do I go to? What a business or what profession should I get into? What kind of person do I wanna be? And I remember when I was your age, and these were some of the questions that I was asking uh, myself. Um, so I didn't die, you know, I became an adult. I made some important decisions. And it's true that, you know, some of the decisions that I made, my context is different, I come from a different place. But hopefully, you know, some of the things that I, I tell you about, they might make you, kind of give you some ideas of the things that you would like to do. But first of all, before I start talking about myself, uh, you, know, you might know that I'm a poet, so it's easier for me to talk about me and some of like, my context through the things that I write. So I wanna take advantage of the opportunity um, to read a poem. I'm gonna read it first um, in Spanish, and then I'm gonna read it uh, in English. And I'm gonna read it in Spanish, you know, just in case that you're taking Spanish. So you might enjoy this. But also, there's so much of the poem, you know, that you can get through from the, the rhythm and its language. So before I start reading this poem, let me, give you, uh, let me give you a little bit of a context for this poem. Before I wrote this poem, three things happened. Number one, uh, I had a friend who was going through depression, and I knew how difficult it was for him, you know, to go through all of it. So I was keeping him in the back of my mind. Then I was on the way to a city that is called Esteli in Nicaragua, and then I saw a man who was begging on the bus, and he was just like, his arms and his legs were crooked, and it was really painful, you know, to look at this uh, person begging and look at how he looked physically. And number three, at that point I was writing, uh, I was in the flow. If you're a writer, you know, you know what that means, I was in the flow, I was writing my first uh, collection of poems. And in the context, you know, that I imagined for writing this collection was the poet being at night in his bedroom and then receiving the visits of dead people and that dead people, you know, were telling him stories about how they died in a very violent way. I promise, I'm not crazy. <laughs> or I think I'm not, right? <laughs> but that was like my process through, through writing these poems. So let me start writing the first one. In Spanish, it's called Sumado para Carlos Fernandos. Carlos Fernando, Señor, recibe como sacrificio el cuerpo de ese hombre que llega a ti y te ofrece la suma de la fractura de sus huesos. Escucha su voz que a esta hora de la noche resuena en mi cuarto y junto a mi cama decide contarme la historia de su agonía. Míralo al quitarse la camisa Expone sus costillas al resto de cadáveres apilados en mi cama. Examina sus brazos torcidos, sus manos y sus pies apuntando al revés. Un par de clavos crucifican su pelvis y fijan su dolorosa travesía al Gólgota para sostener su desvelo. Escucha sus huesos, crujen, estrellan y hacen añicos. Señor, perdona las miradas indiferentes y perdóname a mí porque soy igual que ellos. Now in English. 
joined for Carlos Fernando. Lord, accept a sacrifice the body of that man that comes to you and offers the sum of the fracture of his bones. Listen to his voice that at this hour at night echoes in my room and next to my bed, he decides to tell me the story of his agony. Look at him when taking off his shirt, he exposes his ribs to the rest of the corpses piled on my bed. Examine his crooked arms, his hands and feet pointing backward. A couple of nails crucify his pelvis and fix his painful journey to Golgotha to sustain his insomnia. Listen to his bones, they crash, crack, and shatter. Lord, forgive those who look with indifference and forgive me because I'm like them. Something that I want to point out, you know, about this poem is that a very, it's a very strong poem. And then at the end of the, the last dance, I talks about indifference. And, and this is something important for me. Um, you know, uh, humanity in general, we all suffer. That's part of the human condition. Um, and then it doesn't matter where you are from, what country you're in, you suffer, right? That's part of being human. But if I talk about my context, about Nicaragua, um, in Latin America in general, we know about suffering. We know about suffering. It's been, it's been a wild ride all along. Um, if I talk, for example, about my context, uh, before I was born, if I give you a little bit of a historical context, in the Nicaraguan Revolution in 1979, uh, from 35,000 to 50 people died during the war. There were 500,000 people homeless. And then at this time, the population, it was 3 million. It was just 3 million Nicaraguans. So you can have an idea of how many people died. And then during the decade that I was born, in the 80s, there was a contra war. Uh, there were 30,000 lives that were lost. There was an economic blockage, um, a high inflation, destruction of in infrastructure. And then Nicaraguan economy uh, moved from being one of the best economies in the American continent to all the way down to being close to Haiti or even worse than Haiti. And this has, been, this has been the history of Nicaragua for the 200 years you know, that we have been independent. So I grew up in that context. And even though I'm talking you know, about Nicaraguan history in general, um, I have to tell you about my particular context. When my mom was at pretty much in 1718, she went all the way to the north of Nicaragua. Uh, she was part of the Sandinista you know, movement. She, um, she exposed her life. She, there were many times that she almost died because she was very politically involved. The only way that she was able to get out of that, the conflict at that moment was to get pregnant. And that's how I came into the picture. So she was not let go of the place unless she got pregnant. She got pregnant and she saved her life. So it's, it's really interesting for me, you know, when I discovered that I might have saved, you know, my mother's life. That's just fascinating. If I can talk about Nicaragua, Julio Cortázar, which is a very famous Argentinian uh, writer, he wrote about Nicaragua. Nicaragua, so violently sweet. That kind of gives you an idea of the kind of context that I come from. So then the question is, can you be indifferent to a situation like this? Because we're talking about the past, but even now, Nicaragua is living under a dictatorship. There's violence, there's poverty, there's lack of education. People have been leaving the country you know, for the last uh, couple of years. So can you be indifferent to that? You could, you know, if you want to survive and you don't want to feel pain. But in my particular case, when I was very young and because of the way that I was raised, I decided that I didn't want to be indifferent. So when I had to decide what kind of person I wanted to be and I, how I wanted to use my talents, I decided that I wanted to do something to help others in the way that I could. And what do I mean by that? I was aware that if you remember this parable from the talents, that if you receive a talent, you're supposed to use it, not because other people need you, but because it's your responsibility as a human being to use your talents to serve others. So when it was a moment to decide, 
uh, what career should I go for, I already spoke you know, English. So then I was like, all right, I'm gonna become a language teacher. Has that been really, um, has, done, has that done any, any good? It has. I had to have the opportunity you know, to teach kids that have come from very underprivileged uh, backgrounds, and they have had the opportunity to learn the language, and they have improved their lives. I learned sign language, so I volunteer uh, for the deaf as an interpreter um, and a teacher for many years. And I have done other things. But that was not with the purpose of thinking, you know, oh, poor people, they need me. Because I don't think that's the mentality. The mentality is, I have these talents, and then what am I supposed to do with these talents? When I decided to become a writer, it was the same thing. I'm an introvert. I love reading. I love spending time by myself. It was the opportunity you know, to learn more about other people and write about their circumstances. Um, what is my point? You might feel a lot of pressure right now to decide what to do, the, the university that you want to go to. But be true to yourselves. What do you really want? What are your talents? Uh, what are your values, most importantly? How are you going to use you know, your talents and your values to serve other people? Don't think about money and fame. You know, those things come and go. They're important, but they come and go. Think about something that is going to actually add meaning to your life, whatever that is. Thank you.